getting you beyond the basics. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Church on the Couch here at Regal Heights. We're glad you're with us here today. As we go through the book of Hebrews, we're in chapter 5. If you, this is your first time tuning in, we encourage you to uh, not only just to watch this one, but to go back to the beginning of Hebrews 1 because it does follow a whole thought pattern all the way through. And during the week, we also put out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, what we call Director's Cuts, which is a little bit more information that came not directly related to, but somewhat related to the topic of each Sunday that helped fill in the gaps. And so today in chapter 5, we are learning on moving beyond maturity. Uh, as we learned last week about Jesus being the great high priest of the new covenant. And just before the writer of Hebrews is about to explain that in greater detail, he takes this chapter uh, and then he, he kind of jumps in the middle to talk about Christian maturity so that we can understand it correctly. Because he thought jumping in too quick was going to be tough for a lot of people. Uh, this was also common in many of the other books of the New Testament. We have where a writer will start a thought and then have to go back to something elementary uh, to make sure a person understands it correctly and then continues on. In this case, as we're going to be learning next week about the ministry of Melchizedek and how Jesus is a greater high priest and king than him. If you've never heard that name before, uh, you are going to be learning quite a bit more about the inner workings of our salvation. This is also important, too, because in this chapter 5 and into the beginning of chapter 6, we have uh, the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us beyond uh, our thinking and get us beyond thinking about menial things. In fact, the New Testament has many instances where we should not be uh, dealing with particular t topics because it takes us away from learning the deeper truths of Jesus Christ. So we're called on to maturity, not to immaturity. And there's things that the, uh, the first century Jews who were Christians uh, at that particular time were doing. Some of them were talking more about their own genealogy uh, as using that as a pedigree that they were more special in the church than somebody else because they could be connected to, say, the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Benjamin, uh, which was just useless for anything. And, and so we want to get beyond uh, just a small thinking. And again, some people used uh, the faith of Jesus Christ that he forgives sins as a license to do more sin. And that we learned in the book of Romans is ultimately false and shows an extraordinarily immature, if not an unbelieving, mind. And so with that, there's a couple things listed here to help us to mark out what is immaturity. So it's one thing to help guide people towards maturity, but sometimes we've got to put our finger on, using scripture, what is immaturity? What are the immature ways that each of us have, and how can we put those aside so that we can pull the Word of God closer to us, so that we can grow in our faith to be more than just have a cursory knowledge of our faith? You know what? There's a lot of people in this world who have kind of skimmed through the Bible. They know kind of the gist of the Bible stories, and they think that they know all that is needed to go about their days. Um, but I want to encourage you that we are supposed to be doing much more than that. We are supposed to be knowing the deep-seated truths of our faith so that we can be uh, effective and equipped for every good work. And if we don't have good training, we will fall away easily. And the most people who have fallen away in the last generation have been Christians who have had a cursory knowledge of the Bible, and that is it. It was easy for them to be picked off, for them to be lied to, to say, the Bible really didn't say that. And they were not firm enough in their faith in order to withstand uh, the scrutiny that has come along. Now, if you grow deep in your faith, the scrutiny will come. Remember Jesus talking about uh, he who hears my words and my teachings and lives their life based upon them will be like the man who built his house on a rock. The wind came and the waters came and crashed against the house, but the house still stood. We need to dig deep and put our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ. So this is an encouragement for you to be a diligent student of Jesus Christ, for us to be able to recognize without offense that we have immature ways within us that we need to deal with and that we can jump into this faith so that we can be effective because we need to be, otherwise we will fall away. In fact, that's what we talked about the last few weeks. Uh, the writer of Hebrews frequently used the phrase from the Old Testament, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like you did in the rebellion. And so with that, we want to make sure that we just don't have a little bit of information that we easily get rocked off kilter. We want to make sure that we are firm uh, with our footing on Jesus Christ. And that takes a declaration on our part. It doesn't take just a little bit of reading here and there. It takes a purposeful declaration on our part that we are going to follow Christ and learn. And with this, this also shows to, uh, shows to us in Scripture that uh, anyone can do this. Anyone can have a good, deep knowledge. Yes, some of us uh, won't be as smart as some of the scholars that are out there, but each of us, even those who may uh, not think highly of themselves intellectually, can wrap your head around what we're about to be teaching next in these next few chapters. It's going to get heavy. 
If you're the person that likes church services that are just like, here's five ways to have a good work week, uh, this isn't the service for you. I want to encourage you that uh, we are going to be going deep here in these next few weeks as we finish this book so that you can be confident in Jesus Christ, that you can be confident in your salvation and confident that no matter what you see that happens on this earth with your eyes, God is in control and he is going to see that everything works to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So why don't we just dive right in as we uh, talk about this being how we get to get past immaturity. Let's start in chapter 5, verse 11. In verse 11, it says that uh, after he'd been teaching on uh, numerous things about that Jesus was greater than Moses, Jesus was greater than the angels, Jesus even greater than Melchizedek, which we're going to learn a bit later, uh, and that he is the great high priest of the new covenant. So he's teaching these complicated things to really help the people, his original hearers, to not give up on the faith. Because they were being persecuted, they were being looked down on, they were uh, in, in a condition to where uh, they were at risk of falling away. And so Hebrews was written to strengthen those who only had a cursory knowledge of the inner workings of the faith so they could be strengthened to settle their, their uh, whole being on the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So this is where we go into a therefore, meaning that he was already talking about all these complicated things, and now he comes here in verse 11 to say, we have much more to say about this. Remember I said how we're going to talk about Melchizedek in a minute? So we have much more to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. He is not insulting people's intelligence. He's more insulting their will. This is a bit of a sharp rebuke. Uh, so he's not saying that you're, you're hard to learn, that somehow you, you can't. It's, no, you guys are paying attention to more things. Think, think of it like this. It bewilders me that people cannot uh, uh, learn more about our faith diligently, but yet when the new top ten comes out, we know all the lyrics to the latest songs. Uh, and, you know, kids out there are learning TikTok dances every minute of every day. You know, people are learning every single day new things. We're learning about new restaurants. We're learning about new ideas. And we're learning about, like I just said, new songs. Why can't we learn this one book that God has given us so that we can know him, love him, and share in this peace uh, in his work here on the earth? So it has more to do with our will. Do we want to put our effort into learning or do we want to learn the next number one song that's our favorite? I believe you can do both, by the way. Uh, but let's put our intellect our whole being into uh, the Word of God. So we have much more to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, by this time, though you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have been trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death, uh, and in faith in God, instructions about baptisms, uh, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. So if you are a little unsure of the inner workings of even those things that we said, do you understand what it means to lay hands on someone and the theology behind that? Do you understand what baptism is, what it means, and the importance thereof? Do we understand what it means of works that lead to death? Do we uh, understand how to have faith in God? Those are going to be the director's cuts of this week. I'll be uh, teaching on that because I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of us that could uh, brush up on these elementary truths. But they are called elementary, meaning that if we were mature, we would know these uh, in full at this particular point and juncture in our lives. So if we don't know the ins and outs of those four things, five things that we just mentioned, then we cannot call ourselves a mature Christian. I don't say that to uh, wag my finger or to give disappointment, but to realize that we just don't know what we need to know in order to do, to do something. Case in point, you want your doctor to be mature in knowledge about medicine before they do anything to prescribe on you. Now, the Christian is God's gift to the world to proclaim the gospel. And if we are not well-trained, we are going out into the world and we will wound other people with our lack of knowledge. This is all that I'm really getting at, is we need to make sure that we are diligent so that we don't harm others. Uh, if we are just going to sit in our own basements all day, every day, and never do ministry, well, it doesn't really matter what you know or don't know. We're not going to be effective one way or the other. But God has called us into the world to do ministry. And we need to make sure that we know these elementary truths. 
so that we can go on to the deeper truths and explain them all to everybody around us. So you can look at the director's cuts coming up this week. They'll explain those in a greater detail to help you to make sure that you have the basics figured out. So not only do these uh, elementary teachings show whether or not someone is mature or immature, the way that we view the world and the way we view God working in the world, if we have a particular mindset uh, that is uh, not set up correctly to God, then we will be immature. And in fact, the Bible is rife with teaching that if we just look at the world from our comfort point of view, then we are immature. But if we look at this world in humble reliance on God to lead us, whether good or bad happens, uh, then that leads us to maturity. In fact, even in the first century, about the time of Nero, there was a, uh, a Greek slave uh, named Epictetus, and he was a bit of a philosopher and taught that those who rely on this world to go the way they want it to in order to be happy uh, as being infants still drinking milk, and that those who accepted the challenges of life that God has given them, that those were considered mature people who ate meat. So this phrase was well known even in the first century, the meat in the milk. And so with that, it is implored on us to be like children who are weaned off of the milk and grow better on the meat once we uh, grow into childhood and adulthood. This is what we should be doing with our faith. We need to put childish things behind, as Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 13, and move on to mature thinking. And that involves our worldview, how we see things around us, what we're willing to spend time on, foolish controversies, uh, foolish entertainment, things that really benefit us not, or do we focus on the things that are going to benefit us and the world? And so the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to willfully want to go after maturity. Having identified things uh, in this chapter and others that I have just shared with you through the New Testament, that uh, we need to let go of the immaturity. And part of the immaturity that we, is prevalent in today's society is offense. How easy do we take offense? If we, as we are going through this life together, and something pops up in any one of our lives that we have an immature way in us, and we become offended um, and defensive, then that also reveals that we are immature. Again, I don't say that to wave my finger and to look bad on anybody, but to help us to do the self-diagnosis. Because if I realize whenever I get offended about something, that is the limit to my uh, ability on that subject. And I need to be able to go beyond that. And so whatever you may find that offends you or puts you in a defensive uh, manner, we need to recognize that as immaturity in our lives, and then we need to address it so that we can go beyond it. Because I don't know about you, I don't want to be where I am in the faith now one year from now. I want to be further. I want to be closer to God. And that is exactly what he wants of each and every one of us is that we grow in maturity, that we, we don't need to be perfect, although we do strive and try to do that, but we need to be looking back on markers in our life to say, you know what, I may not be where I hoped I was at this point in life, but I'm a whole lot further because of the transformation power of Jesus Christ in my life. And what we're going to learn here next is um, switching gears. The, the writer of Hebrews warn, warns again about falling away. He has warned about falling away numerous times in these first five chapters. Why? Because he saw it happening en masse in his generation. And he saw that it was due to people that had a wrong outlook on life, that people had a wrong outlook on Christ, and that people were not taught well enough uh, to, to evade or to contradict the wrong teachings that were coming against uh, Jesus Christ. And so with that, that is very applicable to our day and age. So even though my audience is not Greek-speaking Jews who have become Christians, uh, many of these same things uh, do apply to help you to say, like, a lot of you have faith, a lot of you have explored the faith, and I want to give you the inner workings of that faith. If you are willing to take meat, if you are willing to go beyond elementary things, to learn so that you can have the confidence, so that you won't fall away. I can tell you one thing, the hardest thing in, in ministry for me as a pastor is to watch somebody who has uh, accepted Christ and who has gone after him and then has fallen away, either because if they have uh, not developed their faith or because the pressures around them were, were severe. It, it is very heartbreaking whenever that has happened. And on the flip side, it's quite joyous when somebody returns to the faith uh, and grows deeply and becomes a pillar in God's church. So I definitely feel what the writer of Hebrews was feeling, even though we are separated by 2,000 years. In fact, we have uh, quite a bit of a, 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 an ungodly society today that we're dealing with today. And we need to pray that God can help us to stand firm so that we may reach others in our midst. So why don't we move on to the next part of Scripture, uh, which is in chapter 6, verse 4. 
So going off of that, saying that is it impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance? Because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. I'm going to stop there for just a minute to give a little teaching on that. Now, the church has been locked into uh, can you lose your salvation, yes or no, uh, for quite some time, and I'm not going to uh, have this to go into that. It's a good discussion we can have at some other point in time, but the purpose of why this is brought here is very practical for us. It's a warning against falling away, and it's, and it's very kind of practical in this way. Here's the way that, that I look at it. And what it's saying here is what about those who have, have tasted God, who have seen him at work, and then have turned away? I'm like, well, that they can't come back. Is that because God slammed the door in their face? Is that because they were saved and lost their salvation? Is that because they were just kind of there uh, and never believed in the first place and so they walked away? Uh, who knows? But the real point is this, is that if you see the overt acts of God in your life, the work of the Holy Spirit, and you see and have been shown the sufficiency of Jesus Christ's salvation for us, and we turn away from that, how are we ever gonna come back? If we've already rejected the stuff that we've seen, and if we turn away and go our own way and decide to never come back, how, how can we? Our heart would never want to in the first place. Especially when we realize that it's the Holy Spirit that quickens our heart, that we, is that soft, sweet voice calling us to repent and uh, imp imputes the salvation on us. So if, if we won't hear the overt acts that God has done around us, how are we going to hear the sweet, small whisper of the Holy Spirit? So the encouragement is this, you and me are all partakers of God's goodness. We breathe his air, we live on his world, we live in his universe, and we should recognize that he has proven himself more than enough for us to not walk away to follow our own desires. And if we ignore such a strong cloud of witnesses, it puts us in a very difficult position to ever come back, if not impossible, because we've ignored such an incredible salvation. So I want to encourage you. Uh, you may have walked away, and you may be looking to come back to the Lord. I want to encourage you, if you're having those thoughts, then to do so. You know why? Because I've had some people say, Jay, you know what? I, I used to go to church, uh, but I feel like I've just rejected God with my life these last number of years, and I just don't know that God would ever welcome me back. I'm like, okay, if you were truly hated God, you would not be thinking those thoughts. So the fact that you are thinking those thoughts, your heart is tender towards the Lord. You may, you may feel a little guilt or shame about having walked away, but you're still, your thoughts are towards God. So I'm telling you, come back. He is ready, willing, and able to do so, just as all of us as prodigal sons at one particular point in time, where the Father is waiting to bring us back in. So I want to encourage you to come back in, let the Holy Spirit heal you, to heal your heart, transform your life, and to forgive all the things that we have done uh, when we have ignored God. And so I want to help you with that to understand that if you're thinking about coming back to the faith, you could not do so if the Holy Spirit was not whispering in your ear and that you were also not being cooperative. In short, you're never too far gone for the Lord to bring you back in. So the, what we need to do is this warning against falling away is to love the Lord our God, to not succumb to pressures around us that will try to pull us away. Let us become faithful and then let us become fruitful. And the next few verses goes on to teach a little bit more about what happens when we are unfruitful. If you remember back when we went through uh, the Gospels, we talked about the parable of the fields, the parable of the sower, where it talked about where God had, uh, as the sower has sowed seeds, some went on the path, some went in rocky ground, some went in thorny, and some went in the good soil. And then we learned that only the ones in the good soil uh, grew to height and then grew to fruit. The others grew but ended up getting cho choked out or scorched, uh, and the one on the wayside never took root at all. So here we're moving into an, another agriculture example. And as we do that, we're going to help to understand that uh, most of the world at this particular time was farmers or directly related to it, so they'd understand it. So let's go into chapter 6, verse 7, uh, for the next few verses to help us understand that. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop that is useful to those that farmed it, and they receive a blessing from God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless, and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we uh, speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. 
He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So this switching of gears from calling us on to maturity and away from immaturity, also with the warning of if we do fall away, then uh, what is often uh, a common agriculture thing is that if we don't produce fruit spiritually, he's saying like we're like the thorns and thistles that don't produce fruit. And typically what farmers in the ancient world did when a field became overgrown with uh, crops they did not want and that were unfruitful is they would light it on fire. And by lighting it on fire, it would kill them and their seeds and then leave a fertile uh, ash base for a planting of next year. So what we don't want to have happen is uh, the fact that we do take up space, that the gift that God has given us, we don't want him to be able to take that away from us to give to somebody else. And so let us be faithful with the gift that we have and let us move on to fruitful ministry. And getting sidetracked with immature things stops us from producing fruit. It stops us from becoming mature and it stops us from advancing the kingdom. And so this analogy is given, but then the, the, the writer of Hebrews is quite hopeful. He's given the strict warning and the strong warning, and, but he's also saying, but for your guys' case, I know your hearts are tender. You guys are just dealing with a lot. This is basically what he's saying. And he goes, I want you to imitate those who have shown themselves to be diligent. And he's used that word a number of times already, talking about us having a restful effort to have a diligence that is based upon the peace and guidance of God, not us toiling in frustration, but that we make every effort and that we do not be lazy. We are told numerous times just to not be lazy. You know, in the book of Revelation at the end, when it talks about all the, the deadly um, sins that we do that lead to death, that laziness is part of them, right up there with murder and idolatry and things like that. Why? Because if we are lazy about things about the faith, what is more important? If we don't have the faith, we've got nothing. And so we need to make sure that we are diligent and that we are following the example of those who have worked diligently among us and that we not become lazy, but we become good at growing in our faith and then helping others to see the light as well. So now we move on to the certainty of God. Uh, this is important because though we talk about uh, what our end of the deal is, we talk about us not being mature and growing to maturity. Now we're talking about God's end of the deal, how he will bless us and how he will help us and how we can be certain of that promise despite what we may see around us. In short, what you see, don't let that rewrite what God said. So let's read the, the few last verses in chapter 6, and uh, that will help us to gain the confidence to know that God uh, has brought us this far, but he didn't bring us this far to only bring us this far. He is going to continue to use us and grow us as we move forward. In the same way that the writer of Hebrews was cautious and worried about the, his listeners, he was confident that upon hearing this, that that would spur them on to these good works. But then that also good works don't last just for themselves. We need to know that God is in it. And this is why we need to have the confidence of God uh, in our lives. So let's read these last few verses. So when God made his promise to Abraham, so he's giving an example here, there was no one greater to him to swear by. So he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what he promised. Men swear by something greater than themselves and the oath confirms it and is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God uh, wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, that's us, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have uh, fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf and he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So what God's getting at here uh, through the writer of Hebrews is that God is a promise-keeping God. He made the oath to Abraham, he swore by himself on it, and he's launching us in the future saying, this is not going to change. You don't fall away, you're good. Stay with us. And it's important to know too, this is a bit of a legal term. Now, it's not just an oath of I, if I swear by something uh, that makes uh, it binding. What it is is almost like a co-signing of a, a loan. It's like getting somebody who's superior to you to tell the bank, yes, this person will pay it back, and they sign off on it. It is a legal transaction, really, to be able to do so. That's why God said, don't swear by heaven or uh, swear by the temple, because I'm not giving you an endorsement if you have to do that. 
God doesn't want, is not going to be giving an endorsement to people who swear to God on something, or I swear on your mother's grave, or things like, well, you can't do that, uh, because your mother's grave can't vouch for you. People who are alive, we appeal to our superiors to show that we are trustworthy. That's what that's getting at there from a legal challenge point of view. And so by God being God himself, he swore by his own name, saying, I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. As much as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. And so when this God says, I'm going to save you, if you follow me, then we can take that to the bank. No pun intended. And then so with this, we look at the sacrifices that we give in ministry. And oftentimes people view sacrifice as something that is to be lost. But I want to tell you something about the, the beauty and the amazingness that it is to be able to sacrifice. A sacrifice is an investment. A sacrifice is not robbery. So when God asks us to sacrifice, he's saying, I'm going to give you something better if you give me this. He wants us to respond in faith. That's what our sacrifice is. Whether it's our time, talent, and treasures here in the church ministry, that what we are doing is we are putting, giving something of ourselves back to God in response to what he has already done for us. And then he promises to take that sacrifice and elevate it eternally. How incredible is that? So sacrifice, anything you have ever sacrificed, whether it's your time, talent, your treasures, your emotions, your mental state, helping somebody who is a very difficult person, all of that is an investment into your eternity with God and even your blessing and calling here on the earth. So know that God does not rob you when he asks you to sacrifice. He is inviting you to be blessed through sacrifice. How awesome is that? That gives us the confidence. What should all that make us feel? You know, that, there's a lot, of, a lot of thoughts in there to, to run through that, but this should let us know that our God is a promise-keeping God and that he loves us and that he's actually going to reward us even more so for us acting in kind and proper to the faith that he has already displayed. That uh, it lets us know that we are important. It lets us know that we are valued. It lets us know that we get to be a part of his work. And it should help us to realize that he is so reliable. And it's like, these are all the things that we should feel about this, and this should well up in us, that we get to be a part of this wonderful journey with Jesus Christ. And that doesn't have to be a burden. It does take effort, but it shouldn't be toil. And that every sacrifice that we give, everything that we have ever had done wrong to us in this life, God is going to repay it a hundred times over. That gives us the reassurance that even though we don't know why things are always the way that they are, we know that God will work all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so what do we do about this? The first thing we do is we cast off immaturity. So we learn the basic elementary truths of our faith. We make sure that we're not sidetracked by foolish arguments. We don't need to, to show up to every fight we're invited to or every argument we are invited to. And there's many of those out there today. Let's take stock of our own uh, lives and say, what are people doing to drag me away from my faith and are being distractions to me? So let us move the distractions out of our life so that we can focus on Christ. So that the more that, as, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, that we need to be continuously doing these things. In other words, we need to practice our faith on a daily basis so that we will grow in it, so that we may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, hi, I hope this helps you to know what it takes to get beyond immaturity into maturity. I hope you know this is all positive in nature, that this is something that we get to do, that we get to get rid of the immaturity in our lives. We get to have the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us into maturity. And then we have the will of God and the Word of God to help us to do so effectively and carefully so that whenever anybody asks us about our faith, we will have a transformative experience to be able to share with them and theological insight to help lead them towards Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for tuning in today uh, the Church on the Couch. Why don't I pray with you before we go? Heavenly Father, God, you are good, and your mercies endure forever. Uh, Lord God, I just think of the, the amazingness of this word that uh, you have given us through the book of Hebrews. That we learn that the, the pressures that push people to fall away uh, were just as true 2,000 years ago as they are today. So God, I pray that you would help us to recognize the immature areas of our lives, to help us to recognize the pressures that are trying to pull us away from you, and to cast them all off so that we can grow in our maturity and in our relationship with you. So God, help us to uh, not be offended when the light gets turned on in an area of our life that needs to change. And Lord, help us to not be defensive about those things as well, but that we become repentful that we repent of all these things and that we strive for because we know there's more ahead of us than behind us. Thank you, God, for giving us the promise of a future, the promise of rest, the promise of power, and the promise of relationship with you here and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.